If you want to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17, we're going to start on uh, this chapter. Um, this is going to follow uh, Paul and Silas and Timothy. We'll rejoin Paul uh, in the second missionary journey. Um, in this part, Paul will uh, travel from Philippi to Thessalonica, which is a province of uh, Macedonia in the Roman Empire, and it's the uh, capital of its province. And and uh, anyways, um, I was thinking that Jim was reading this morning Ephesians chapter two. That chapter, if you listen to it, it really calls for uh, a peace between the Jew and the Gentile. And Paul uses some um, illustrations. Uh, in his writing, some examples to help um, the Jews and Gentiles understand the point he was driving at. But I like particularly that illustration of the dividing wall uh, being uh, leveled because in the temple, out in the courtyards, there was a wall. It was about waist high that separated the Jews and the Gentiles. And the Jews were not or the Gentiles were not allowed to come across that wall, even uh, of penalty of death. Uh, so, so Paul knows what he's doing when he's, when he's writing to these churches and uh, explaining how they're no longer strangers and foreigners, but they're part of the body of Christ. <laughs> Anyways, I kind of got off there, but I just thought that was interesting that Jim picked that scripture because it's one that, that I've heard a lot and uh, always makes me think about how God is pressing us toward unity in, in all we do. He wants us to be a unified people. So in Acts chapter 17, we're just going to read through the first 15 verses together, and then we'll go back and, and study them intently. Now, when they had traveled through Ampophilus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus who I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with the large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men have upset the world and have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they act, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, There is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were, no, no, were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greeks, uh, Greek men and women. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as as soon as possible, they left. So what we have here is a tale really of two cities, Thessalonica 
and Berea. And there are a lot of similarities between the two, and we'll point those out as we study them together. First of all, let's get started in verse 1. It just tells us that Paul is traveling on the Ignatian Way. And as I told you before, the Ignatian Way was this highway built by the Romans that that extended through Macedonia and connected all these cities together. And it was better than 400 miles long. The city of uh, Amphipolis was 33 miles west of Philippi, where Paul was. And then another 30 miles was the city of Apollonia. And then another 30 miles beyond that was the city of Thessalonica. So Paul travels approximately 100 miles to get to Thessalonica. And Luke tells us that there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, Now what we should understand by that is there was a synagogue in Thessalonica But evidently, there wasn't one in the other two towns. So Paul just went right on through there and went straight to Thessalonica. And then he says in verse 2, according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now, according to Paul's custom, he went to them. I want to read to you what Gareth Reese writes about evangelism. And Paul's method of evangelism was to preach the gospel to the Jews first. And he says, we may learn from Paul's methods, some methods for evangelism in our own day. The evangelist, whether at home or abroad, will have to develop a prospect list, indicating what people are the nearest ready to accept the gospel. He will approach these first, using their present level of understanding to build Christian teaching and commitment. He will seldom win them all. And in the process, he will probably win some who he did not expect to be receptive. Somewhere in the process, he will probably reach a point where responsiveness becomes negligible and opposition sets in. The wisest worker will then shift his approach to take advantage of the greatest responsiveness in others and will go on to reap and glean the greatest possible harvest. Now you and I think about, uh, I'm going to get a Kleenex, as we witness in our community. We, We don't have any Jews in our community, do we? No, we don't. Not that I'm aware of. Our community is full of Gentiles, but we have in our community those that are on the verge of being receptive to salvation. And as Reese suggests, we should take note, literally, and write down those people that we think are most receptive to Christ. And once having developed that list, we should go to those people and have a conversation about the Lord. And uh, we might run into being rejected or we might, they might be receptive and and want to give their life to Christ. And I think it's important that Reese points out that we seldom win them all and we would be surprised by some. Now I remember, oh, it's probably been 10 years ago uh, we had different neighbors catty cornered across the street. The Schoonovers lived there. And for whatever reason, it was on my heart. And I knew Scott had been brought up in the church, but uh, we were good friends. And, and so he was one that I thought that I reasoned would be receptive. And I went over and I talked to him about baptism and about uh, the saving grace that's available through Christ shed blood, and, and, and we, went, we went through some scriptures together. I read Romans chapter 6 to him, and, and he was very receptive. And I was scared to death just because he was a friend and a neighbor, and I thought if he's not receptive to this, this is going to be a dividing thing between us. But it wasn't. 
and and he thanked me for talking to him and, and sharing with him. Now, little did I know, about a month later, he made a decision to be baptized. He didn't tell me he was going to, but he did, and he was he was immersed into Christ. So it just it's just advantageous for us to think about those people who are ready and go share with them. And if they don't, don't press, don't judge, just share the facts. You know, it's important for us to realize as in verse two that Paul reasoned with those people in Thessalonica. Now we can, we could possibly somehow fill this church with a lot of young people, and I could preach a message of hellfire and brimstone and scare them, as many of us probably in years past remember evangelists doing, and scare them into salvation, making them think, thinking about the, the, the suffering and the torment of hell. But see, we don't want to scare people into Christ. We don't want emotionally to push people into Christ. That's all fine and good for us to have an emotional response to the gospel. But the gospel is what we need to share. We need to do just what these characteristics that I wrote down of Paul that we're going to read about and study about as we go through. We need to share with people from our mind and help them think about the knowledge that's available in the scriptures to tell us that Jesus is the Christ. We need to share with them in the scriptures that tells us what is necessary for salvation. We're not appealing to their emotions when we do that. We're appealing to their intellect. And it's from that ability to measure or think about what is logical that a person makes a decision. If they make a decision based on emotion, let's say we guilt them into it. We haven't really won them over. Now, Paul is very bold. He goes right into the synagogues where he's been rejected over and over, thrown out, stoned, uh, stoned, beaten with rods. But Paul's very bold. He's very faithful. And he goes in and he reasons with these Jews in the synagogue of Thessalonica. And he does it for three Sabbaths. So I think Luke is telling us that Paul does this over a course of two full weeks, a, a Saturday, a Saturday, and a Saturday. Okay, but that's 15 days. What's he doing in between those times? Well, we know what Paul's doing. He's a tent maker by trade. Paul is providing a way for himself to, to, to eat, to, to move on. And so it's during the week that he works at his occupation, and then on the Sabbath he goes and he shares with the Jews. And he taught them, or he reasoned with them, explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And he said, this Jesus who I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. Now, what scriptures did Paul possibly use to reason with, to help build his case logically speaking? Well, in my mind, he no doubt went to Psalm 22. And if you want to turn back there, we're going to read a little of that together. Psalm 22. Some of this is going to sound very familiar to you as we read. Starting in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel and you, our fathers, put their trust they trusted and delivered you, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved in you. They trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by people. All who see me 
mock me and hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast upon you. and my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for my trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and my bones are all out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. Now let's stop there. Look at some of these scriptures that Paul would have pointed to with the Brians and said, Jesus fulfilled these prophecies, these scriptures while he was on the cross. I mean, to think that he said, I can count all my bones, people stare and glare all over me. And then he says, they divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. And we know that on that scene on Calvary, the Roman soldiers did that very thing. He said that his he would be pierced. He says that all of his bo- jump, all of his bones would have been out of joint. And what was common for the Romans to do when they were executing someone by by uh, uh, crucifixion is they would nail one uh, hand first and tie it to the beam, and then they would take a rope around the wrist of the other hand. And they would stretch the hand so far that it would pull the shoulders out of joint. A lot of these things that we read, Paul would have said, you see, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the one who this was written about. Now turn over, uh, go past uh, Song of Solomon and Proverbs to Isaiah. You're really close to it. Just flip back a couple of of, uh, books. Isaiah 53. This is another scripture that I think Paul shared with the churches in Thessalonica and Berea. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, that, that, that's a... That's a a way of talking about the strength of God. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a like a root out of dry ground. And, and this is talking about the Messiah, the suffering servant. And the Jews don't like this. The, the Jews won't look at these scriptures and realize that this is Jesus. They, they want a Messiah like David like Solomon. They want a king, someone to rule, someone to overthrow the Romans. They don't like the idea of the Messiah being a suffering servant. So they've skipped over this. Generation after generation, generation, they they didn't look at this as messianic scripture. They just, they just ignored it. But Paul is saying this is the evidence that Jesus is the Christ. He grew up like a tender shoot before him and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. 
He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like the one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Peter denied him three times. Thomas doubted that it was Jesus. People, after he would heal towns and cities full of people, the Pharisees would still reject him. Over and over he was rejected. Like the one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and he was, and we esteemed him not. Now here it talks about the saving grace that God put our sins on him. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God. We Jews considered him stricken by God. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought him peace was upon, that brought us peace was upon him. That saving grace. Jesus was pierced. Jesus was crushed. Remember they took a, they took a mallet or a hammer and they bashed, or they were going to bash in his knees and they, and they said, no, no, no. He, he was stopped from that because he was already dead. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. I'm going to skip to verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Even on trial before the Sanhedrin, before Pilate, before Herod, he did not defend himself. He was led like a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silence, he did not open his mouth. Number nine, verse nine. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. He was crucified. He died with thieves, but yet he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Paul would have pointed to that as being prophetic of Jesus. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, verse 10, and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the, and the will of the Lord prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by the knowledge my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. He's going to be the king. And he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Who are the transgressors? We are. They were. We are the ones whom Jesus bore the iniquity and sin. It's our iniquity. It's our sin that Jesus took. And Paul would have taught this all in the synagogues in, in greater fashion than I am. He would have really elaborated and talked about how, how Isaiah and how David were writing prophetically speaking of Jesus. So he reasoned with them from strict scriptures. He used the knowledge that they had and he reasoned with them and said, this is Jesus. Now, we, we have an incredibly greater advantage than Paul did in sharing testimony with others. Why is that? Anyone have any answer to that? We have the Gospels themselves. We have eyewitness evidence of Jesus' ministry, of Jesus' life, and how he ministered for three years, died and resurrected, and then what we're studying now, the church was established through the ongoing work of the apostles. So 
The result was, and some of them, not very many, and some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a large number of leading, or a number of leading women. So there were a few Jews, but it says a large number of God-fearing Greeks. These would be proselytes of the gate, which we've talked about before. These were Gentiles who had converted to Judaism short of being circumcised. And these leading women would be women who held power or were wealthy that were, uh, that were Gentiles living in Thessalonica. But for many of the Jews, they had become jealous and they had taken in some wicked men from the marketplace and formed a mob. So just as happened in Galatia, the Jews become incensed. They, they don't like that Paul is convincing other people of this uh, new religion. And that's how they would have looked at it, as a new religion. So they go down to the marketplace. Now, wicked men is a translation of the word paneros. And it's a word that implies taking delight in doing harm to other people. These were guys that were of no account, just hanging out, loafing around the marketplace. And they wanted to make a quick buck. And the Jews probably paid them to incite a riot. And so they, they formed this mob and they set the city in a great uproar it's the same thing that happened in Galatia. This rabble began to parade around uh, through the street, raising outcries against these missionaries. And they're out for blood. So they come to the house of Jason. And Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. So Jason's house is apparently where Paul and Silas were staying. And it may have been where the church was assembling together in Thessalonica. Uh, this bringing them out to the people doesn't seem in the Greek to be just a happenstance. Um, it's more likely, Reese says, that it's a reference to a regular town meeting where the government of the city was administered. He says, Thessalonica was a free city and would have had its assembly of the people. But they didn't find Paul and Silas. So they've got to get somebody to satisfy their viciousness or their craving for justice. So they drag Jason out and the brethren that are staying with him and they bring them before the city magistrates or authorities. Now, this is very interesting. In the city of Thessalonica, the city officials were called politarchs. Politarchs. You've got uh, that polit, which is, we know, the, the uh, basis for politics. But these were politarchs, political rulers. For the longest time, until the 1800s, many biblical scholars thought that Luke had erred here because nowhere else in Scripture is the word politarch. But I want to read to you what, what uh, Reese says, that this is a very unusual term occur occurring nowhere else in the New Testament, nor indeed in any classical writer. So even writers after the New Testament didn't use the term politarch. Aristotle, whose politics, that's a, that's a book he wrote, well nigh exhausts the list of all known official titles in Greek cities, and it does not even mention the word politarchs. On this evidence, or lack of it, the negative critics used to say that Luke made a mistake in this place in Acts, and therefore his record is not trustworthy. Thus, also implying that the doctrine of inspiration is suspect. So if they find an error, they can create 
a hole in all of Paul's testimony. But at the western edge of the city, an archway dating to the time of Vespian has been found on which the chiseled name of Polytarch is found of seven men. Other inscriptions, too, have been found in Macedonia, five of them from Thessalonica, which show that Polytarchs was the regular title for the political leaders of the city and that Luke was exactly right and the critics were exactly wrong. Folks, I want to tell you, when you read Luke or Acts, what you're getting are the facts. You don't have to worry about whether they're true or not. They're dead true. They're, they're incredibly true. They are right on the money because over and over and over, these little tidbits of information that Luke gives us, unlike any other gospel writer, have been proven correct by archaeological evidence. Now, why is that important? It's important because it validates our testimony. It validates Luke's testimony to be true. You know, Satan wants to refute and poke holes in the Gospels and all the writings of Paul and say, we can't trust them, but we can. The Gospels are the truth. The epistles are the truth. Have confidence in your New Testament. And we need to aspire to be like Paul, to be knowledgeable of our scriptures. That means you and I, we should be reading the Bible daily. It's the most important book that we can ever get our hands on. It, it tells us what we need to do, what we need to know to go share the gospel with other people. We were not. I want to, I want to give you some ground, groundbreaking news here. I've said it before. We were not put on this earth to serve our own pleasure. We were put on this earth to do God's will. That's the reason we are here. And to do God's will is to share with others, and to share with others is to give them the facts and reason with them. So <clears throat> the accusations against Jason, the one that really sticks is found in verse 7. They said, and Jason has welcomed them, the missionaries, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another King Jesus. The Politarchs would not be able to ignore this. It would be treason to proclaim that there was another king other than Caesar. And so the city officials are worried that if they don't administer justice, the Romans won't like it. So these men from the marketplace, along with the Jews, they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. So what do they do? They make Jason post bond. What, what, is he, what is he giving his money to assure? He's telling Jason, you post bond and you guarantee that there won't be civil unrest because of these missionaries again. Basically, they only find Jason guilty of aiding and abetting the missionaries. They don't find him guilty of treason, but of housing the missionaries. They say, we're going to make you responsible for the peace in Thessalonica. So they put them uh, basically under the surety of a bond. I don't know. How, we don't know how much money they had to put up, but they had to put up quite a bit. And if Paul and Timothy and Silas come back and they get the city in the uproar again, Jason's money goes out the tube, and then he can be held legally liable, uh, civilly liable for Paul and Silas's testimony. Now, it's one thing for Paul and Silas to be bold and go give testimony and be beaten by rods. But it's quite another thing for Paul and Silas's testimony to bring persecution upon others 
Paul and Silas want nothing to do with that. So they are sent away to Berea. And they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now verse 11. They go to Berea, which is 60 miles from Thessalonica. They go to Berea and they run into more noble-minded Jews than those in Thessalonica. This is one of the few times that we find in Scripture that when Paul goes into the synagogue, there's no problem. He's, he's received well. And these Bereans, they receive Paul's word, his testimony that I shared with you, with eagerness. They're, they're encouraged by this testimony. They're encouraged so much that Paul or Luke says that they examine the scriptures daily to see whether what Paul and Silas were preaching was true. They examine the scriptures themselves. Now, these Bereans are well known in our day and age. People talk about, are you a good Berean? That means, are you checking out your scripture? Are you studying the word of God? And the result was that many of them believed along with the number of proselytes again. So Paul wins a bunch over in Berea and everything seems to be going well until the Jews in Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed there and they were having great effect. And we can probably imagine these guys being rulers of the synagogue or Pharisees, but they're willing to travel 50 miles or 60 miles to stir up the crowds in Berea against Paul and Barnabas. So they sent Paul out, says as far as to the sea. And we find out that he ends up in Athens, it says in verse 15. But he leaves behind Silas and Timothy. Now what's the purpose in leaving behind Silas and Timothy to this new church in Berea? They're going to need to learn more about doctrinal evidence of Christ. They're going to learn more about the gospel account. Uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, may have been written already. And they may have that document to share with the Bereans. So it's important to realize that whenever you witness to someone and you make them a convert, and, and we all know what we do to uh, help another along to the faith. We, we share with them so they might believe so they might confess, so they might be obedient and submit to the waters of baptism. Okay, that's, that's what we teach, but it's important. It's just like this lady from Centerville. You know, I'm gonna press into her mind that she be part of a church family where she can receive encouragement, where she can learn more about the faith in Jesus Christ. And, and we need to do the same whenever we go out into the community and witness to other people. Don't just leave them with, oh yeah, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus. That's not gonna cut it, folks. They'll fall away. They'll be like that seed scattered on rocky soil. They'll be all excited for a minute and then they'll fall away. We need to be persistent but we also needed to realize when someone is rejecting our testimony and, and move on, okay? Because there are others that will be receptive to your testimony. Wow, I've went 40 minutes. We're going to prepare for uh, communion now. Um, let's, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful so much for uh, the missionary efforts that were made by Paul and Silas in Berea and Thessalonica. Father, we know that uh, all of this produced great momentum in evangelism uh, for the early church. And Father, it's because of that momentum that was made by these missionaries, generation after generation after generation, 2,000 years later, we're sitting here today saved Gentiles. We, we are 
grafted in. We are no longer aliens and foreigners, but we are part of your family because of what Jesus has done and because of what these early missionaries did. Now, Father, we know in our community, in our world, there's all kinds of wickedness, ungodliness, um, characters just like these bad men, these unsavory men that were in the marketplace. We, we've got a community full of people that we would call loafers that are willing, waiting to make a quick buck that really aren't engaged in anything meaningful. Father, those, you love those people too. And, and we need to witness not only by what we say, but what we do. And Father, I know that I have a lot of shortcomings and I'm so grateful, Father, that, that you provide forgiveness. And, and Father, these saints here today, they have shortcomings in their lives too. And, and we're just thankful that the blood of Christ covers it all. So I pray, Father, that as we go in this time of communion, we would reflect on what Jesus has done for each one of us, that we would remember all the agony that he went through starting in the garden where he agonized in prayer and asked that there might be another way. But when it, when it push came to shove, Father, he was willing to do your will. And I pray that we would be like Jesus in that fashion, that we would be willing to do your will. Father, thank you for this day, for the lovely snow that was such a surprise this morning, the beauty of, pure, of that pure white color. And it reminds us of how you see us since Jesus gave his life up for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.